PA by training. So I helped a lot of small businesses, individuals, and nonprofits uh, do tax compliance in my prior life. Um, and as many of you probably know, uh, it's not easy. Um, number one, filling out that 990 form, especially if you have to fill out that whole 990 form and all those different schedules. Um, and the fact that nonprofits don't pay income taxes, there are still other taxes that uh, nonprofits are liable for. If you have employees, you will be subject to employment tax and workers' compensation. If you have auctions or um, raffle prizes, you will learn about the tax rules around that as well. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here with all of you. Um, a couple of things before I introduce uh, two speakers uh, who are here, your elected officials. Um, during this time, there are a lot of tax scams happening. Um, there are going to be people that may call you and pretend that they are the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board, or even the Board of Equalization saying, we can't read your tax return, we need your Social Security, or we're verifying that you know that the account number you put on your tax return is right, can you verify your bank routing number? Um, we see you have taxes due, we need your credit card, right? Um, it is really happening, and these folks now are calling HR departments and trying to verify uh, employee information that way. So they may not be calling you, but they're calling your companies um, or your HR people. So uh, just beware that the tax agencies, we do not call uh, and ask for any sort of private information, social security, credit card, or bank routing information. Um, if you get a call like that, please hang up, ask them to send you a notice in the mail, and if you could call and let us know so we can alert others that this scam is happening, that would be very helpful. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, we have your assessor, recorder, long time, over 30 years, started um, as a small business owner as well, and now is doing all of the assessments and has been a great leader, been working very closely with him, someone who is passionate about his job, Mr. Rich Benson. Good morning to everybody. Um, welcome. You're in very good hands here today. I looked at the speaker list. And you've got some true experts from the State Board of Equalization besides Fiona here, people that do it on the levels that are the day-to-day -day functioning. You ask, well, why is the assessor, recorder, county clerk here? Well, for a lot of nonprofits, um, they come through our portals at the Marin County Civic Center for several different reasons. So welcome if you come to my office. You may come in first for a fictitious business name at the county clerk's office. You may come in to record something at the recorder's office. And you may get a reception from the assessor's office for some taxes. And I suppose the single most inquiring question that we get from nonprofits who own property is, why do I get a tax bill? I'm a nonprofit, so I shouldn't be taxed. And it depends, and you're going to hear a lot from the State Board of Equalization today about it depends on what the facts are. Just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you're non-taxable from a property tax standpoint. Falls under the Revenue and Taxation Code 214, which fundamentally is it has to be a nonprofit that's using property for tax exempt purposes. So there's a lot to be said about that, and you'll hear it today. So I just wanted to welcome you again. Feel free to come by my office and, and say hello anytime. Any questions you have, please let us know. We have a big website, lots of informational links, and if you can't find it there, you're welcome to call me. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Rich. And, and Rich is true. You will hear, I think, today uh, the words, it depends a lot. Um, so, please ask your questions of the speakers here. We also have folks who are manning the booths around that are experts in this field. Grab their cards, you know, use them as a resource. Um, and again, you know, the assessor's office is doing a great job. And then the last uh, speaker before we start, Mr. Josh Friday. He is your um, mayor pro tem of Novato. He got elected in 2015, and this is his hometown. 
Um, he actually served um, in the United States Navy, so has a, a distinguished <coughs> Navy Armed Services career, uh, was the Chief Operating Officer for Next Gen Climate, a leading organization focused on climate change, clean energy, and political change, and now is the president of the Golden State Opportunity. And we are working very closely with him and his organization, Joe Sandberg, on trying to get folks to qualify and claim the California Earned Income Tax Credit. How many of you know about the Cal EITC program? Yes, so if you make under $54,000, uh, we, you can, we can do your taxes for free. We, meaning me and my staff, have uh, become certified IRS tax preparers, and we uh, can help prepare your taxes. And we are really trying to encourage folks, even if they don't think they have to pay taxes, to come and file and let us see whether they qualify, you qualify, for many of the uh, tax credits that are available. Not only education credits, but also this Cal EITC credit. And Josh Friday is actually leading the efforts around the state to make sure that more people uh, are filing and qualifying. So Josh. Hello, welcome everyone. And I'm actually following Fiona's lead and, and leading the charge to make sure that uh, working people around California get this incredible earning of tax credit. Welcome to Novato. We're so thrilled to, uh, to have this incredible event here today, uh, this really important event for our entire community. And we're, we're excited to have you here for a few reasons. One is we get to showcase and show off one of, one of what we think is a crown jewel of not only Novato, but of Marin County, which is Homer Bound. And we have uh, Mary Kay Sweeney, the executive director here, who does so much for our community uh, and, and helps so many people. And the fact that we have it here in Novato is something that we're, we're just incredibly proud of and we're glad to showcase here to you today. If, did anyone here get a muffin or a scone before we sat down? Raise your hand if you got a muffin or a scone. I want to point out that those <laughs> delicious things that I have to go run five miles now to work <laughs> off of are actually cooked here by this phenomenal staff. Let's give them a hand. Around. Food this incredible staff, please come here and come to the key room. We want you to be here. We also want to welcome you to Novato, and the other reason we're excited to, to be here is I actually uh, get to walk here and then get to walk home. I live right here in, in Hamilton, and we really pride ourselves here for what we do for nonprofits because we know that you guys and the work that you do are the backbone of our community. And I think we're at a time right now more than ever where our communities desperately need civic infrastructure. And they need civic infrastructure because people are looking for a place for services and comfort. I think people are looking for a place to serve themselves and give back. And I think now people are looking for a place to feel like they're part of something that's bigger than themselves. And every single one of you gives people in our community those opportunities. And for us to be strong as nonprofits and for you to be strong for our communities, you need to be strong. Which is why we're so grateful and thankful to Fiona Ma for putting this event together and for Assemblyman uh, Mark Levine and for Senator Mike McGuire and our county assessor and for everyone who helped put this event together uh, because this is going to allow us to be strong for our communities. And so we hope you learn a lot today. We hope you take away notes. We hope you ask a lot of questions. Um, and I do just really want to uh, take, take an extra second to point out that um, our uh, Board of Equalization representative, Fiona Ma, goes above and beyond her duties every single day to make sure that we have what we need as a community. And we are incredibly grateful to her. We'll thank her for everything she does. Uh, and we're all better because of her. So thank you, Fiona, for doing this. Thank you, Josh. Yes, um, so one of the things that I was always frustrated with is, is um, you know, kind of taking, um, not giving the information or, or doing seminars uh, you know, that are easily accessible uh, to the community. So since I got elected, we've been doing these type of nonprofit, small business, and veteran seminars in the community to make it easier um, for all of you to attend. We have a wine symposium coming up. Um, so anyone who is in the winery business, we will have one. Um, we are also gonna do a bigger small business expo in San Francisco. Uh, also in May, May 4th. May 4th, and that should be in your uh, newsletter um, that is in there. And in my newsletter is helpful and handy tips. So it, a lot of it is real questions that come in, real issues, um, real cases that we hear, 
and I really try to get it out to you so um, hopefully you don't make the same mistakes. Um, I do want to introduce a couple people, uh, Ray Sanguinetti uh, in the back there, he uh, manages and oversees all my six different offices, field offices, does a great job, they all love him. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to grab his card. My chief of staff, Genevieve Joponda, is also with me most of the time. And then Noah Starr, he is my outreach, one of my outreach folks, and he's going to be emceeing today. And then we also have Veronica Shinzato, who heads up our outreach, doing a fabulous job uh, on these different events. Um, I also want to recognize your assembly member, Mark Levine, and your senator, Mike McGuire. Uh, unfortunately, they are not able to be here because Monday through Friday, nine months out of the year, they are in Sacramento representing you. So they have a, a session, floor session uh, today, but they send uh, their regards, and we have two of uh, assembly member Mark Levine's um, district reps here to help me present certificates. Uh, to Homeward Bound uh, of Marin as well as the Key Room, opened in 2008. It's a social enterprise of Homeward Bound of Marin, and uh, they are the ones, the men and women back there, um, that are, are here preparing your food um, and drinks here today. So again, if I can get some of the representatives, Dr. Sweeney, um, Rich Benson, come on back up, Josh Friday, and I don't know who is who would represent the key room. Anybody back there? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Okay. Let's get out the light. Take a picture. And here we are. Yeah. Right. And again, if you have any questions or we can be of service, please do not hesitate uh, to call me, my office, or any of my, uh, my team members here. So thank you and have a great day. Okay, up next we have uh, Dr. Mary Kay Sweeney, who's the Executive Director of Homeward Bound of Marin, who again is the nonprofit who is hosting us, um, who also oversees and manages the Key Room, which is the lovely venue that we're in today. So, Mary Kay Sweeney. Thank you so much, Noah. What a, what a wonderful event. And also, I want you to know that since this is the first day of spring, we decided to bring the sun out for you. I hope you appreciate that. Well, first, we'll, we are a full service organization here. Um, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, this is a venue that we've created, well, many years ago now. It opened in 2008, as, as was mentioned. But we created it as a community asset because we really wanted to serve the entire community, not just with the programs we have for people who are struggling to work their way out of homelessness, but also for the entire community to appreciate and have a place to really meet and greet and have a good time. So this place is open for um, rental for any kind of events that you might have. And Vicki is our, our queen of ambiance over here, I call her, and she also uh, schedules all the events here. Now if I can figure out how to work this little device, yeah, I'm from the generation of uh, mimeograph papers and, uh, and carbon. Uh, so, here we go. Ah, look at that. Okay, so uh, just a, a quick overview of our agency. We were started in 1974, and our whole purpose for being in ex whoops, existence is, um, is to end homelessness in the community as the best we can. So, we've changed that kind of in a way to talk about Hey, this is going too fast. Wait a second. Okay, here we go. Hold it here. Um, we've changed it in a way because we really are working one one person at a time to help them with their struggle and their issues to get out of homelessness. And it's really a, as you can imagine, a gratifying business. And some of you here might be in the same kind of business in your particular community. So we applaud your efforts too. Um, the nonprofit world is a challenging world to be in, right? Especially now with. Uh, 
portent of, of funding sources uh, drying up. But anyway, well, we're going to keep our, our sights on the prize and say that we are trying our darndest to, uh, to work together in the community to serve people who are struggling to make it and to work in our community as well. One of the things that we have here is that we have a Fresh Starts Culinary Academy. Unfortunately, this is the week off because we said graduation last week. It's a 10-week program. So these uh, folks you see here are our graduates of our program, and they're, they've graciously decided to help us out today. So we're really grateful to them. Um, go back here. One of the questions I had was, there we go. Um, being a nonprofit in Marin County, what are some of the attributes you, you have to kind of develop? And one of the things that we know, and you know too, is that you have to be mission driven. I mean, you have to keep that eye on what you are doing and not stray from that because that really focuses what your efforts are in the whole world. So it's really wonderful. We're also collaborative. We're a small county here, so the more organizations we work with, the more uh, partners we have, the better we can do the job. Um, we're also innovative. As you can see, we've uh, developed several different strategies to, to create a funding stream for our organization. One of them is our event space here. We also have other things we'll talk about later. We have a whole line of products that we developed as well. Um, we're flexible. You have to be flexible. You have to be so nimble in this business, right? Uh, you just have to be able to, to dance with the times and, and really respond in life to the people who are in need. We're also hopefully compassionate. We're trying to solve one of the, the country's most vexing problems, and that is homelessness. And so you have to be really innovative and compassionate and flexible. Effective, so one of the things that we are always talking about is being data-driven. And so that's something that we're really focusing on. How do we prove the success that we're having? How do we really know when people are successful? And so that's the kind of focus we have over the years. And also, um, committed to learning. We're always striving to figure out what's the best way to serve people who are in need of host houses. It's, it's always changing and evolving, and so we have to be on top of that, too. So this is the latest. Um, some of you are from Nevada, so you may have seen our Oma Village project, which opened. Actually, people moved in last month, some of the families. But it's a great, whoops, great drone picture, isn't it? I mean, it's really cool. 14 units of housing for homeless families. And it's a great, great location, right near the freeway, schools, shopping, everything. It's right down the street here. So if you go down the highway, you'll probably see it. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. And our strategy always is to raise the funds ahead of time. So all the rents we collect go toward the services. So that's how we kind of, so it takes, therefore, a long time to build something like this. Uh, it took us, I think, five years for this one. For the space you're in right here, which is both our admin office, our event space, and some housing next door, it took us eight years to raise the money for that, so it would be debt free. Okay, um, here's job training. Um, our culinary academy, some of our graduates over here, yay! Um, so uh, we've got culinary academy, and um, it's, whoops, here we go. The culinary academy is just really a highly successful uh, business to be in or a schooling to be in because it's a 10 week program now and graduates are able to be placed in jobs because we have an advisory board of employers right after they graduate. So within, within a week of graduation, 80% of them are placed in jobs, which is really excellent. And some of them work here too. Yeah, so outcomes, so over the uh, last year, we served about 1,300 people. So because we're generalists in the community of serving homeless people, we serve families, individuals, seniors, children, people, people with mental illness. See, it moves very quickly. Um, so, so one of the things we also do is, um, is we graduated a number of students. Oh, all right, so please note that where organizations get money is not the same as where you should get money, all right? Because some is good for somebody, somebody, but not good for you. But this is kind of a, a fast overview of all the ways to get money, all right? So, uh, this is kind of our plug slide. I guess I should tell you, you mentioned one thing about our lobbying work. Um, that's kind of what we are, Chamber of Commerce for Nonprofits, and right now we're very involved in working on things in the state legislature in particular uh, to support nonprofit organizations. We also have a student debt project and an overhead project, and we also provide health insurance for a great many nonprofit staff. So if you're interested in any of those things, please uh, come speak to Christina or me afterwards. She's holding up her, our insurance flyer. All right, so, uh, and these are some of our new publications, sorry. 
Um, and if you give us your business card or write down your email address, uh, we will mail you these, email you these slides, okay? So you don't have to try to take notes if you don't want to. And because California is our state bear, I mean our state animal, sorry, our state mammal, um, <clears throat> we're trying to use bears, okay? It's not like we have a bear fetish, it's our state mammal, all right? <laughs> Okay, so how do we get money in the nonprofit community after all? There's two basic buckets. One is contributed income, which is donations, and the other one is earned income, where we do some kind of work and get money for it. How many people here have some kind of donations contributed? Almost everybody. How many people here have some kind of earned income? Almost everybody. Okay, so the fact is almost all of us today are hybrid organizations. We have both contributed and earned income. All right, now let's take a quicker look at total at the contributed income side. There's two buckets here. One is institutions like churches, foundations, and corporations. The other one is individuals. And there's several ways we ask people for money. We ask them by mail, we ask them in person, uh, we ask them to put us in our wills, all those we ask them through Twitter, all those kinds of things. Okay? And then taking a close, closer look at the two buckets on earned income, there's two kinds. Again, one is income related to your mission, and the other one is income not related to your mission. And that's the only one of the four types I'm not going to talk about, right? Income related to your mission would be, for example, government contracts to provide housing, for example, like Homeward Bound does. Um, fees charged to consumers, like tuitions at preschool, for example. Um, all those kinds of things. If Planned Parenthood, for example, sold condoms, that would be earned income that's related to their mission. That would be income related to your mission, but if Planned Parenthood also opened a McDonald's, for example, that would be income not related to their mission. I don't think. Maybe they could maybe they could for it. Okay, so just a quick look again. Four kinds of income, two kinds of contributed income, two kinds of earned income. All right. So for each of the following ones, I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you the types of funding sources within it, then how to find them, and then what they typically give. Like you want to know if they typically give a million or five dollars, right? And then what they typically require, all right? So each thing, we're going to go through all four of these types, all right? Is this going fast enough? Am I talking fast enough? All right. I'm slower. I need to talk faster. All right. All right, so foundations is the first type because this is the one everybody's heard of. How many people here get foundation money? Okay, so some, looks like maybe about 20% of people here. And there's, um, there, there are three basic types of foundations. One is a private family foundation. For example, the YNH Soda Foundation. Um, those, they're, they're usually often named after families, the Irvine Foundation, for example. Um, second type is community foundation, like the Marin Community Foundation. This happens to be a picture uh, of James Head, who's the head of the East Bay Community Foundation. Um, there's also public foundations, which kind of two examples in this area are the Women's Foundation of California and Horizons, which is the California GLBT Foundation. So these are created by multiple donors, and they typically give money in those fields. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you find them? All right, the single best way to find them is to look on the websites and annual reports of your people that are doing something similar to you and see who gave money to them. All right, so for example, if you're working with autistic children, look at all the other autism organizations and see who gave money to them and write them all down, okay, and then look them up. And the second best way to look at it is to do an online search, right? And you can either do that at the Foundation Center Library in person, or you can subscribe to uh, the Foundation Center's online uh, search program, which I have to say is a little bit expensive. All right, so that's the type, the different types, how to find the ones that are likely to fund you, um, and what do they give? So foundation grants are typically in the $2,500 or more range. Um, and they're usually, not always, but usually for a specific project. So they don't usually say something like, you know, you are just such a great organization. We love what you're doing. Here's $2,500. What usually happens is that you kind of ask them for a specific project. Like, we have, like say, a child care center and our playground equipment is really getting rusty. We need $2,500 for a new playground set. And so they typically fund a specific project rather than funding your organization as a whole. 
I don't like that, but I'm going to try not to rant about that right now. All right, so, um, and here's what they usually want, which in other words is saying, if you don't have these things, this probably isn't a good strategy for you. So one is you need to have 501c3 nonprofit status or to be working under the auspices of someone who does. You need to have good writing skills somewhere on your staff or volunteer group because a lot depends on the written application. You have to be able to talk in the language of foundations, right, which is just like every field has its own jargon. Um, foundations have their own jargon and you need to learn that language so that you can write your grant proposal in that language. It's not quite as different from English as, say, Chinese, but it's uh, noticeably different words. Right? And it takes patience. If you need money next week, a foundation isn't going to be the place for you to go. Uh, sometimes it takes them months, six months, ten months, fourteen months to make a decision. They usually will want to come and visit you, and you have to be very conscientious with paperwork. So if you're one of those people that loses your tax forms all the time, foundations, you either need to not ask foundations money or you have to get better at the paperwork. All right? So you get the flow? All right. Please feel free to get up and get another muffin or coffee if you have I or anybody else is talking. Okay, corporations. How many people here get corporate money? Okay, so not too many. Right? That's kind of a sign, right? How many people here are getting particular kinds of money? Like Autodesk here in Marin, for example, would be a great example of a corporate program. There are usually two kinds of corporate giving money. One is the corporation itself gives the money, right? And the second one, like so, for example, um, Autodesk, and Autodesk is a bad example, but another corporation, for example, they just give money straight from the corporation. And other corporations have a foundation, for example, like the GAP Foundation, right? And so there are different types, so be aware that there's two ways that corporations typically give. Um, and they, the other area for business giving is from mid-sized and small nearby businesses. And this is where people often kind of neglect. They often think, oh, we need to go to like the Bank of America or Wells Fargo. But actually, a lot of times the mid-sized businesses in your own area are actually good choices. And they typically give small grants. The, meet, the average corporate gift in the United, across the whole United States is 3500 all right, that's not the ones that make the papers, but that gives you an indication that these are pretty small grants, typically. Um, they frequently do give non-cash gifts. For example, they may, um, if you have, for example, a shelter for homeless youth, they may donate uh, clothing, for example, to it. Uh, and then they often do sponsor events because they want to be better known in the community. They want to be seen as sponsoring a good event. Uh, and they also fund through script, these kind of, how many people here use script? Okay, some, okay, so that's a good system for schools, for example, organizations that have a lot of constituents because it's a great way for constituents to shop at places like Target. All right, and, okay, so corporations typically give, number one, to non-controversial causes. If you do something controversial, like say try to overthrow the U.S. government, or something slightly less controversial, like taking children to see their parents who are imprisoned, I mean those are kinds of things that corporations typically shy away from funding. Um, they like to fund nonprofits near their headquarters. Okay, this is unfortunate, but it's really true. That's why Northern California lost so much of Bank of America funding when the Bank of America moved their headquarters to North Carolina. Uh, uh, they like to fund nonprofits where their employees volunteer. Um, and so it's important to ask all of your volunteers all the time, where do you work? Right? Because often that's the best way to go to a corporation. If you say, you know, we have you know, 15 people who regularly volunteer in our after school reading program, that really opens up the eyes of the HR department and the giving department at that particular corporation. Uh, they typically want to see 501c3 status. And they often really care about a connection to a senior, a senior level employee or to a volunteer manager. All right. I hope I'm going fast enough here. All right, churches. How many people get here money from churches or some kind of religious organization? Okay, some. Um, so most congregations give away money in some way or another. Uh, 
And there are also these kind of church groups, for example, United Methodist Women. It's not a church, but it's kind of a church group. Um, and sometimes they might not give you money, but they might ask their congregation to donate to you. So those are three kind of good ways to think about religious organizations. And how you find them is you ask every single person, your volunteer and staff and constituents, what church do you go to? What mosque do you go to? Right? That's how you find them, just by asking. Okay? They typically give small amounts and they typically give non-cash, but a lot of times those are really important, like about allowing you to have, for example, meetings at their location. Um, they like to have congregation members that are active uh, in your organization, and usually they want you to come in person and talk to them. Like, you can't just email them, you know? I want you to come and talk, for example, to the board of the church or the deacons or some kind of group like that, uh, and maybe even to the whole congregation. Right. I think the church-related and congregation-related giving is kind of underutilized. Um, people just don't think of it, I think, and it's an, an important thing to think of. And especially as we may be heading into more difficult um, economic times, uh, we know that congregations are often the ones that step up the highest during times like that. Okay, now individuals. How many people here get some kind of individual donations? Well, lots of people. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So there's two types of individual donors. One is people you know, and the other one is people you ask. Okay? And how do you find them? You start by asking everybody you know. Right? And then among the, the other good thing here is to find out who's giving to similar organizations. So this is why, for example, you want to look at other organizations' annual reports and their donor walls and things like that and see who's giving, because that tells you who's interested in this area of work that you do, and also who's interested in this geographical area. So maybe you have a museum, like I met somebody from the Museum of Bicycling about an hour ago who's here today, and you know what, you want to find people that are interested in museums and interested in giving in Marin, because it doesn't really help you if they're interested in museums, but they only give in Long Beach, right? So <clears throat> you find this out in part by, um, by finding this issue out about who goes to similar organizations. And so I remember one time when my younger daughter was about five or something like that, she was supposed to go to this birthday party and she didn't want to go. And her older sister said to her, if you want to have friends, you have to go to parties. <laughs> and uh, so this is kind of the same thing. If you want to have funders, you have to go to parties, which means you have to go to other organizations' events. They'll appreciate it, number one. You'll get to meet people, for example, that give in that area. Uh, it's, and you'll meet other, anyway, just do it, okay? It's the right thing to do. <laughs> Go to parties, all right. Um, and then you ask a lot of people, and then you see who responds. So, for example, you might ask all of your volunteers, for example, to post something on their Facebook page saying, this is too late for this, but you might have said, you know, like, we're an Irish organization, so on St. Patrick's Day, show your Irishness by giving money to this Irish cultural organization. Ask all of your members to, uh, volunteers, to post that on their Facebook pages, and then that way, you'll get an idea of who actually might be interested in this, and maybe they only gave you five dollars, but you have somebody who now, who you know is interested in your work. Okay? All right, and what do individuals give? They often give smallish donations, sometimes called membership dues. Um, they give by attending a fundraising event. They also give large donations. Um, they give bequests and plan gifts, which is writing somebody into your will. Um, always, uh, <coughs> actually, I was just talking to a guy who runs an organization in the East Bay, and he said that um, uh, somebody had read, a, read an article, had the um, Independent Journal had actually written an article about them, even though they're um, in the north part of the East Bay. And, uh, and so someone had been giving them $100 a year for about four years. And then she telephoned it. She wrote him a letter and said, you know, um, I'd love to have a chance to meet somebody from your organization, but I live in Sausalito. And so the executive said, well, great, you know, $100 a year. But he went out and met with her. And um, um, and they had coffee together, and then at the end of that meeting, she gave him a, an envelope and said, uh, this is for you. And he got to the car, and he opened it, and it was for $50,000. Um, and then a year later, she died and left them three quarters of a million. So of course, that doesn't happen to everybody, right? But it shows you that the $100 donor may be somebody very important if you pay attention to them, okay? Um, 
And uh, let's see. And what individuals donors usually want? They usually want to be asked by somebody they know. That's ideal, um, but it doesn't have to be. They usually want to be asked for a specific amount. Like, would you contribute $50 for this or $500 for this, something like that. And they usually want to be told in general terms what it's going to be used for. You don't have to say something like, you know, well, $82.47 is going to go for the cost of the meals for the kids. You have to just say, this is for taking kids to the seashore, all right? Um, and they usually want to be thanked in writing pretty soon afterwards, all right? So, um, and how do we ask individuals? Well, we ask them by mail, by telephone, by email, by text, at an event in one-to-one -one in person, every way that's possible. And we ask our supporters to ask people they know. And there's a great myth in the nonprofit sector that I think is, um, and that is that um, all board members should raise money. And I would say for some organizations that's true, but I don't think it's true for every organization. And I think that not everybody is comfortable asking people that they know for money. Most people are quite comfortable asking someone they don't know for money. Uh, they just don't want to ask somebody that they know for money. So we can respect that and have everybody ask other people that they may not necessarily know themselves. And particularly these days, Facebook and Instagram happen to be particularly good venues for raising money in a way that's pretty easy to do and most people feel comfortable asking for small donations from their friends through a vehicle like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Government. How many people here get some kind of government money? Okay, so some, okay, maybe 10% or so. So city, county, state, and federal contracts are examples. And government contracts are typically pretty large, $10,000 or more. And you find them by attending events like this one. Uh, you ask other organizations for suggestions. And the other thing you can do is ask your elected officials for suggestions. So for example, um, you know, call up a city council member or a member of the, count, or the board of supervisors of Marin. And rather than saying something like, I'm, I want to come talk to you and ask you for money, say, you know, I want to come talk to you and just explain to you briefly how our organization helps our community. And then while you're there, say to them, you know, we're trying to raise more money. Do you have any suggestions for what government agencies might be interested in? So they're often very good connections for things like that. So that's a great way to identify potential government funders um, if you don't have any right now. And also, having met those people, they come in later, handy later on. So government agencies typically contract for health and human services, for example, help for the disabled, homeless shelters, etc. Um, and sometimes for community activities, like a health festival that you're going to have, for example. And they typically require more than a few years in business. You know, they don't want to take a risk on somebody who's just started or is about to start. So if you're brand new, probably you shouldn't worry trying, trying to get government money. Um, uh, it's very helpful to have a relationship with elected officials or with administrators. Um, uh, you have to have pretty well-developed accounting systems, and you have to have a high tolerance for paperwork and bureaucracy. Uh, <clears throat> government funding represents, in general, about 30% of the nonprofit community's money. Right? So, um, and it's one of the most stable kinds of money. Very, very few foundations and very few individuals give somebody significant money for, say, 30 years in a row. That isn't true with government. Government does often contract for services for that many years. So they're both significant contracts, and they're typically for a significant period of time. So particularly if you're in health and human services, or in some cases in the environment or the arts, these are important ways to, um, to get money. And I do want to say right now, in today's political climate, we're very concerned about government money. Um, the, the proposed federal budget guidelines that just came out last week from the federal government, from the Trump administration, show, for example, a complete elimination of the National Endowment for the Arts, complete elimination of National Endowment for the Humanities, big cuts in community-based, uh, community CDBG, Community Development Block Grants, um, and a number of other areas that would be really significant, cutting out AmeriCorps, um, uh, really, we have, um, we've taken on this issue, Christina spent part of this weekend faxing our letter to all the California representatives to Congress about it, and even though those are federal issues, that money often flows through counties and through states and even through cities, 
So uh, we have a much bigger stake in the federal government's budget this year than we ever have for many, many years. And so it's something to be alert to and to think about uh, taking some action on. <clears throat> um, all right, so that's government money. Now, this is kind of a, a sh what this shows that different civil organizations have different financial strategies. So this is for a graph of five successful preschools. Right? And you can see the first one is its business model, if you will, or its strategy is it's 100% parent paid. They have tuitions from parents, that's it. The second one is 100% government paid. They get money from government to serve kids in child care who are low-income families. <clears throat> some are a mix. Some preschools, for example, they'll have something like 60% of our slots are allocated to government paid um, slots and 40% to parent paid slots. Some are parents in fundraising, where the parents pay a certain tuition, but they also raise a lot of money for the preschool. <clears throat> and then finally, some are parents and volunteers, like a co-op nursery school. People volunteer a certain number of hours a week, for example, in addition to also paying tuition. So if you see something, for example, that says like, oh, well, that's how that homeless shelter, or that's how that civil rights organization gets money, that may not be the same model that's going to work for your organization. <clears throat> Uh, a great example of this is that there is a uh, preschool, I mean an elementary school for children with disabilities on the peninsula. And it's very well known and every year they have this incredible rock and roll benefit for this school. Some of you are nodding. You know, they have like Neil Young at it and Melissa Ethelrich and Huey Lewis in the news. I mean, it's this kind of incredible lineup of stars and they raise this ton of money. And every other school in the Bay Area for children with disabilities says to themselves, maybe we should be having a rock and roll benefit like that. They make so much money. And the reason why they are successful, of course, is because they were founded by Neil Young's wife. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, the strategy that works for those people over there may not be the strategy that works for you. Okay. So the four rules, you need to have a plan. It doesn't have to be a big plan, like maybe five dot points on the back of an envelope. Um, and it needs to just say specifically, we're going to have a phone-a-thon, we're going to write letters, and we're going to have a Facebook campaign, something like that. Um, somebody needs to be in charge of it. Um, and then these two roles, everybody has to do something, nobody has to do everything. Uh, <clears throat> and everybody has to know what's expected of them. Okay? So those are kind of easy rules, and if you remember them, that any one of these strategies might be the right one for you. All right, so this is an African proverb. Um, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. <laughs> right, and you like know that, right? I mean, like if only somebody had started this bequest campaign 20 years ago, some of those people would be dying off right now. <laughs> but leave this money. You know, or if only somebody had cleaned up our database five years ago, it wouldn't be the complete crazy horrible mess that it is right now, right? All of those things. So yes, it's true that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, uh, and the second best time is now. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jan. That was a great presentation. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, we'll have a break and uh, explore, excuse me, Expo Exploration Time. Uh, the California Association of Nonprofits. Welcome. Um, we appreciate all that you nonprofits do on behalf of your organization and the community. And thank you for taking the time to attend this class today. My name is Joanne Berry. I have worked for the BOE for about 17 years as a tax auditor. I'm currently um, an audit supervisor. And I'll be presenting with Sophia here. Hi, my name is Sophia Fakara. I've been with the Board of Equalization for about five years now, and I'm a business tax specialist. And then we also have um, our coworker Lisa in, over by our table that's been answering questions. So today we're going to cover how 
sales and use tax applies to um, certain fundraising activities and how how to pay your sales and use tax if any is due. So now there are a lot of rules, so we're just going to give a general overview. And then afterward, if anybody has any questions, they can, they can ask us later. There is a pink pamphlet that was not put in your packets initially. Um, I guess it didn't get printed in time, but it's back on our table. It's publication 18 about sales and use tax for nonprofit organizations. So, of course, there is the obligatory disclaimer of the contents of these slides do not constitute written advice from the Board of Equalization under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6596. We will explain further what Section 6596 means. And the following presentation is used only as an aid to illustrate general tax concepts, but it does not address every situation. We wouldn't be able to address every situation here. And the Revenue and Taxation Codes, regulations, court decisions, and other applicable laws generally control the decision-making process. Please contact your Board of Equalization staff for a comprehensive response to your specific questions. We'd be happy to help you today on our breaks, and you can obtain our cards and call us later if you have questions. So first we'll talk about what is a sale. A sale is a transfer of title or possession of tangible personal property for consideration, regardless of when, when payment is received. So what does that mean? More simply said, a sale is an exchange of merchandise or goods for something else of value. Money, a barter, trade. Anybody making a sale in the state of California is required to have a seller's permit. So a seller's permit can be obtained online. You can come into our office and we can help you apply. You can apply from your office, from home. Um, applying for a seller's permit is your responsibility as a seller. And it's also your responsibility to report your sales, file your returns, and pay any tax due on time. If you have held a fundraising event and you did not apply for a seller's permit, you should still register with us right away. We can still help you get your return filed, and you might be able to you know, file and pay your taxes before uh, the deadline and prevent any additional penalties or interest. You can also apply for a temporary seller's permit. So if you're gonna have just one time event, you wouldn't need to apply for a permanent seller's permit. We also have pamphlets about applying for a seller's permit on the back the table. <coughs> oh, okay, great. Uh, what are total gross receipts? Total gross receipts are the amounts that are received for the sale whether they're received in money or consideration. So like I explained before, you know, barter, trade. And you must report all of your sales on your sales tax return, uh, not just your taxable sales. And you will be able to take deductions for any non-taxable sales that qualify for specific exemptions, including those that are described in the publications. Okay, so now we'll talk about what what is sales tax? We'll just give you a general overview, and we'll go into um, nonprofits in a minute here. But sales tax is imposed on the retailer, on the seller. Um, it's it's um, the seller may collect sales tax from their customers, but they don't have to. Whether or not the, uh, the seller collects the sales tax, they must pay it. And tax is due on the gross receipts of the sales um, of your taxable sales. So then the next question is, what is use tax? Use tax is generally imposed on the, on the consumer or buyer when they are using items that, that they purchased for, for use but they did not pay tax on. Um, tax is the purchase price and the use tax rate is the same as the sales tax rate. So two of our most common use tax examples are items purchased from an out-of-state seller. A lot of times that's on the internet. You purchase a computer for your organization, you purchase it from out of state, comes into California. If no California tax is on it, then you as the consumer are responsible for the use tax. 
Um, the other example is items withdrawn from your own inventory. If you have a store and you take items out of your inventory and give them away or you use them yourself, you're responsible for the use tax on those items. And the use tax is measured by whatever you pay, so it would be the cost of those items. On to charitable organizations. So, oh, Sophie's going to talk about this. <laughs> so, nonprofit and charitable charitable organizations, as you know, are exempt for, from federal and state income tax. May be exempt from some property taxes and may be eligible for other discounts. However, just because the nonprofit would be exempt from these federal and state income taxes, they are not necessarily exempt from sales tax. There is no blanket exemption from California sales and use tax for nonprofit organizations, charitable or religious organizations. So nonprofits are treated just like any other California seller. An exempt organization can be engaged in the relief of poverty or distress, a religious organization, a school or parent teacher organization, a veterans organization, an organization engaged in health, medical, human services, HIV care, nutrition, homelessness, or disabilities. So as I explained, there is no blanket exemption, and so it's very clear to understand that unless there's a statutory exemption or exclusion, your sales would still be considered taxable. These exemptions are narrow and avail available only to very specific nonprofits. Again, that's why you would want to contact our office and determine if your organization would be exempt. organizations may not owe, owe tax on any of their sales. Some might owe tax on certain type of sales, but not on, on all sales. You know, some can sell food, but not other items without sales tax. Um, and other organizations, again, unless there's a specific exemption or exclusion for your type of organization, the sales and use tax law applies to you the same as it applies to any other person or company making sales. So, and we're going to go into some exemptions in, in a minute here. Stated, all sales of tangible personal property are taxable unless a specific a specifically exempted by law and they're properly documented so it's important that you keep very clear and adequate records your records must show your total gross receipts including the sales that you think are not taxable all deductions that you've claimed on your sales and use tax returns and the total purchase price of all the items that were purchased either without tax or that were used or given away, so that includes supplies, equipment, fixed assets, and so forth. Even things that you've leased uh, or donations that might have been received. So keeping separate records for each fundraising event is a, is a very good idea. That way you can determine certain events may or may not be taxable. Uh, and clearly distinguishing between the taxable and non-taxable sales. Okay. All right, so who has specific exemptions? Um, some of the regulations, uh, 1570 charitable organizations, 1597 proper property transferred or sold by certain nonprofits, and then regulation 1586 is about works of art and museum pieces for public display. And we will also be going into um, regulation 1603, which is our taxable food regulation that has portions that were up, um, apply to nonprofits. So first of all, 1570, these are, these are the organizations that um, no sales taxes do on any of their sales. There are four criteria for them to apply. The organization must qualify for the welfare exemption for property tax. Um, it, the organization must be relieved, engaged in the relief of poverty and distress. 
The organization's sales or donations must be made principally to purchasers, you know, most sales, not all, to purchasers or donees in distressed financial condition, and the, um, the, the item sold must be prepared, assembled, or manufactured by the organization. So two, two examples that, that come to mind about this is the Salvation Army thrift stores and Goodwill thrift stores usually apply for this organization. And they can, um, no sales taxes due on any of the sales they make. <coughs> but they are required to hold a seller's permit and report their sales even though the sales are non-taxable. <coughs> so in this case, your sales, if, if you are a cooperative organization, your sales are exempt from sales tax. And your per purchases, the purchases that you make for donation, are exempt from sales or use tax. So a note is, if, if you are purchasing items that you're going to use, consume, like equipment or supplies, office supplies, you will still owe tax on those items. You have to pay sales tax to your supplier or pay use tax if, if your supplier is not required to charge you sales tax. Okay, some other exemptions we have. Per Regulation 1597, there's organizations that aren't required to hold a seller's permit. Now, with the PTA, Friends of the Library, and nonprofit parent co-op nursery schools, they can make sales without paying sales tax, without collecting or paying sales tax to the board. But they are consumer of the items that they sell, meaning that um, if taxes due when they purchase the items, they have to pay the tax. For example, if a PTA sells, say, sodas at a football game, they have to pay the tax when they purchase the sodas, but there's no sales tax due on their sales. Now, with a qualified youth organization, they can sell food and non-alcoholic beverages without sales tax. They can also sell certain tangible personal property that is created by the um, members of that group but their sales must be irregular or intermittent like them. They can sell at like fairs or galas, certain um, occasional, occasional events, games. If they sell the, um, if the, the qualified youth organization, for example, sells the items they make in a store, then it would be subject to sales tax. It has to be irregular and intermittent. So what is a qualified youth organization? It's a, um, it's a, it has exempt status under 501c, and the primary purpose is a supervised program of competitive sports for youth or to promote good youth citizenship. It also applies to groups that are associated with qualified educational institutions, like a debate team, band, chorus. So most public and private schools are qualified educational institutions. For both the, um, the youth organizations and the educational institutions, they are not qualified if they discriminate on the basis of race, sex, nationality, or religion. So some examples of qualified youth organizations are 4-H, Little League, Boys and Girls Clubs. Some other, some other exemptions for sales of um, meals and food. Meals that are served to low-income elderly people. <coughs> Um, certain criteria apply to these, and again, this is Regulation 1603 if you want to look at more information. Um, so, serve to low-income elderly people, something like Meals on Wheels. Schools, the meals sold to students are not subject to sales tax. If a meal is sold to teachers or parents, then the meal is subject to sales tax. If it's sold by the school, it's exempt, sold by blind vendors or sold by caterers on the premises of the school if they used equipment owned by the school and the students can't tell the difference between the caterers and the school employees. So they can't wear like a special catering uniform. Then all the sales to the students are exempt. <laughs> so um, sales of meals served by religious organizations, nonprofit, veterans organizations, when, the, when all the um, income is used to further their cause, those meals are also not subject to sales tax. 
So sales by social clubs and fraternal organizations, as long as they occur less than once per week and are exclusively made to members, they're not, they're not subject to the sales tax on the selling price of the food. And then the youth organizations we kind of discussed in the last slide. So again, the sale of food can maybe tax exempt or taxable depending on what type of food is it, the circumstance under which the food is sold, and who makes the sale. Now something that is a cold food to go is always non-taxable, no matter who sells it. You have a question? Yeah, in regards to the social clubs and sell uh -huh. selling meals to members, so um, my somewhat foggy understanding of the IRS rules as guests allowed by a member I think is seven. And then they consider it selling to the public. Does that tie in, or is it specifically any guest who pays for a meal? No, it's any, it's any guest that pays for a meal that's subject to sales tax. Um, actually, the, the, the guest can't pay for the meal. The member is the right. If the member pays for the meal, then, then not. But, you know, I, um, regulation 1603. <laughs> so I like say um, cold food to go, not taxable to anybody. Um, the circumstances under which the food is sold. If food is sold, um, to eat, to consume on the premises of the seller is taxable. So if I sell, say, a whole pie that is not going to be taxable because you're not going to eat it there, um, if I sell a slice of pie, it may or may not be taxable, depending on if it's consumed on the premises. I don't, yeah, it's a, it depends. We have a lot of rules. <laughs> So then who makes the sale, you know? If it's a restaurant making the sale, it's gonna be taxable. A restaurant making a sale of hot food. PTA making sale of hot food, no, not subject to sales tax. You know, another nonprofit organization for which an exemption does not apply, maybe um, an organization benefiting animals, sale's gonna be taxable if it's hot food or food served on the premises. Excuse me, mm -hmm. I've always had a question and I'm, I'm not uh, originally from California. I try to understand how the coffee shops they're paying sales tax, they're just not collecting it from the customers. So it is in their bills. Right, they're paying it. Um, they don't have to collect sales tax from their customers, but they do pay it to the state on the coffee consumed on the premises. It's in there. Yeah. Okay, because I've always used sales tax tax exemption for internet sales. If there is an exemption, however, if you're shipping your sales out of state. So if you're shipping common carrier something to any other state, Texas for example, you wouldn't be required to pay sales tax on that sale. Okay, back to me. So, um, and, and Again, on, on the inter, interstate commerce, it, it's, it's the same rules pretty much to everybody. Something like if you ship candy, it's not going to be taxable because candy is not taxable. So, if you're selling with the help of a fundraiser company, you're generally considered a sales agent of that company, and that company is going to re be responsible for reporting the sales tax, not you. However, if you have an exemption from sales tax, it does not extend to the fundraiser company. But again, the burden, they, they are responsible for reporting the tax. So when are you not a sales agent? You're not a sales agent if you contract directly with that supplier to purchase the inventory and then resell it yourself. And you solicit the orders in your organization's name, collect the money in your organization, and you pay the supplier for the cost of the merchandise. In that case, you're not the sales agent. But, but usually with these companies, you're the agent, they're responsible for reporting the sales. And again, if you have any specific questions, you can, you can ask us or call our office. Uh-huh. Does this apply to capital campaigns? I'm not sure what that. That's raising money to build something. Yeah, it's not raising money to build something. Well, it, it depends if, if you're selling tangible personal property. No, we're just taking donations. Oh, no, doesn't apply to donations. This, everything we're talking about, applies to the sale of tangible 
personal, not real, property. But it will result in a very tangible $20 million building. Yeah, doesn't matter. It's this, what you're actually selling. You're selling a thing. So um, other types of nonprofits that have certain um, exemptions, you know, we've already discussed nonprofit awards and religious organizations, social and fraternal clubs. Some more are um, institutions such as health facilities, drug and alcohol rehab, community care centers. Um, they, they are also not the retailers of food. And there's more information in your publication 18. Uh-huh. If an organization is doing a fundraiser where they're selling bricks, they're uh -huh. selling gaming rights and seats, are those tangible assets? Because they actually be used as a fundraiser. No, not unless the person actually receives a brick. Not unless they receive yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so part of the sale to be um, for it to be taxable under sales tax, the title, the title or possession of the item you're selling has to pass to the purchaser. So if you're just, you know, it, it's more of an idea that, you know, we're, you're buying this brick in a building, that, that's intangible. It's not subject to sales tax. So we've listed a few links here where you can go for help. Uh, we have our local board office. We have an office in Santa Rosa, also an office in San Francisco. Uh, we have our board website, our Taxpayer Information Center, and we do have a 24-hour voice recordings for specific topics. We also have a web page specifically for nonprofit, the nonprofit industry. And you'll find a lot of links to the information that you're looking for. And then uh, Joanna looks at I believe somebody mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that this PowerPoint could be emailed. If, yeah, it's if going to be available on our website for 30 days. Uh, All right. To be oh. out. And again, you know, if you contact any of us, we'd be happy to email it to you. say, but I have my 501c3. Well, that's great, but what do you have with California? You know, the state you're in? Um, we get a lot of confusion, so I just want to make that very, very clear. Okay, so um, secondly, I have a little quiz for you, because you guys have just been through some sales and use tax. You have a fundraiser, and somebody at the fundraiser buys a hot cup of coffee, generally not taxable. Um, and a cold sandwich, generally not taxable. They say they're going to take it to go, but they don't leave. They stay. They don't sit down. They just stand at the table. Um, an hour goes by. Their hot coffee is now cold. Their cold sandwich is now warm. Is it taxable? <laughs> Come on. It depends, right? It depends. That's what all auditors do. It depends. What it depends on is what kind of tax you're talking about. So I know a gentleman over there had a question about what the IRS says. Um, that's income tax. So for income tax purposes, no, it's not taxable. It is a fundraiser. It's part of your program. It's not taxable. If it was a social club, you, correct? Um, if it was a social club and at least 85% came from your members, not taxable, not income taxable. Sales tax confuses me too. Okay, so ready to get started? All right, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, look, an old version of my PowerPoint. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to get income tax exemption. How many of you guys are out there um, who are just starting, never had your income tax exemption or anything like that? A couple of you. Um, vast majority already have your income tax exemption. Yes? Okay, I'm not going to make you raise hands. 
But there could be some of you out there that used to have your income tax exemption, but you lost it for whatever reason. So um, part of today, I'm also going to talk about the filing requirements to keep it and what to do when things go wrong. They go wrong all the time, and our staff focuses on helping you guys get back on track because we know most of you are volunteer-run organizations. Okay? All right, so to get started, those of you who already have exemption are good standing, you can kind of just tune out for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, or you could, you know, listen, see if I, you know, trip up, count my number of ums, however that goes. Okay, so the application process, yes, you must apply. We need you to tell us, hey, we're a nonprofit, and, you know, we're doing good for the community, we want our income tax exemption. If you don't apply, we don't know. So if you get a tax bill and you come back and you say, but we have exemption with the IRS, what are we going to say? We are not the IRS. It's good for you. Here's what you need to do to get actual income tax exemption in the state where you're operating. Um, so to get income tax exemption, there are two forms, the 3500 and the 3500A, and I'll go into um, a little bit about them. For starters, the 3500, it's a rather large document. It's a whopping 25 pages. And it's frightening when somebody downloads the packet and they're like, really? Wow, 25 pages. But not all 25 need to be filled out. It's the same booklet, whether you're a charity, whether you're a social club, whether you're a homeowners association, we have lots of varieties of nonprofits. You only have to fill out the pages that relate to you. Everybody does page one through eight, and then everybody else just picks one page, sometimes two, um, out of the rest of the booklet. So we're only talking nine pages. And those questions are tough. What's your name? What's your address? Who are your officers? Roughly how much do you think you're going to be making in a year? And then some specific yes or no type questions. Do you lease property? Um, do you publish anything? Things like that. If you guys miss a question, if you guys don't know a question and leave it blank, we're not going to deny you automatically. If it's information we think you may need, uh, we'll call you. And yes, that's the one exception to Fiona saying. Um, state agencies will call you if you initiated it by filing an application. But we won't deny it up front. The biggies that we're looking for, what do you do? You say you're a charity. OK, there's lots of charities. What do you do? Be specific in plain English. Oh, we run um, a, a um, spaying and neutering drive for animals. Or uh, we're doing a clothes collection for the homeless or blankets. Or we're doing uh, Meals on Wheels for seniors. Just tell us, plain English. You don't have to quote the law back to us. We know how to do that. OK? Um, so in addition to those first eight pages, um, there's a couple of other things that you need to provide. A whopping 25 bucks for the application fee. Why? Because the legislature told us. Um, I know the IRS is 300 to, I think, $800. Um, we don't want to go that crazy, but there's if you plan on making a fundraiser by selling pies made with your Aunt Sally's secret pie recipe, don't put the recipe in the application because anybody can ask for a copy of that application and see that. Okay? Got it? All right. Okay. Once you have your exemption, those of you who tuned out for the application process, tune back in. Hello, hello. Okay, welcome back. Um, once you have your exemption, you have to do some things to keep it. <coughs> I have a better flicker. There we go. Um, okay, you have to file something with us. Why? Because we miss you. You never call, you never write, we just want to know you're okay. So we will have you file information returns. Everybody's like, oh, we have to file tax returns? No, you don't pay taxes, so it's not called a tax return. It's called an information return. Okay, information returns. Form 199 or 199N, I will get into that a little bit. If you are making money outside of your normal um, program operations, such as advertising income or large amounts of investment incomes or things, you may also have to file a tax return, but that's way outside of the scope of what we're talking about. 
Okay, so information returns. We do have some exceptions. How many of you represent a church? Just a couple. Congratulations, tune out the next five minutes of my presentation because churches don't have to file. Neither do political organizations or pension plans. But don't get too jealous because political organizations and pension plans have to file way worse than a 199. Okay, so some of the questions you guys may have had, how do you know which one you file? 199 or the 199N? It's based on one thing and one thing only. How much money do you pull in? Okay, not how much net income, but how much total income, gross receipts, do you pull in? So if your income is normally above our filing threshold, currently $50,000, um, then you would be filing the 199. If it's at or below 50,000, it's the 199N. Years. Okay, I saw a hand back there. How long did it take you? It's quite easy. It's just three questions, I think. So. How long? Uh, literally less than a minute, I think. Less than a minute? I've actually heard up to five minutes. Because it's tough. Who are you? How much did you bring in? Are you planning on continuing? Yeah, it's not difficult. It's just a little thing to trigger us to know, hey, these people are still around. They're still operating. They should be left alone to do their good. Okay? Yes? Paired with electronic software. Now, that doesn't mean, hey, I use a Adobe fillable PDF to manually type it in. It means you actually had software. I think Lucert is one of them. You actually prepared it with software. But there are exceptions. So don't be afraid of, oh, I, I'm going to mail this paper in. I've actually seen 199 spilled out um, in pencil and mailed in. It's OK. Um, there are exceptions. You're not going to be penalized because you can't afford to hire somebody to prepare it electronically. It is OK. So, so don't be confused by that. The 199 is mandatory. Or sorry, it's mandatory to be filed, e-filed. It is totally OK to mail that puppy in, and most of them do. Most organizations hand fill out the 199 and mail it in. But we do. Anybody know what the minimum tax is? It's probably up there. 800 bucks purely for the pleasure of existing in the state of California. 800 bucks unless you are specifically exempt. What do we do in the exempt unit? We offer exemptions. Uh, because if you are a nonprofit, you're supposed to be doing public good, we should be collecting that 800 bucks from you. But we don't know you're a nonprofit until you tell us, which means you could be building up several years of it. The magic number is 2400 I don't know why, but once people start to get that bill for $2,400 and warnings that their bank accounts are going to be levied, that they start to realize, hey, maybe I should apply for my income tax exemption now. Yeah, you should. Um, the IRS doesn't have it, which is why the IRS will usually just grant you when you send in the application and not retroactive. Do not be afraid to ask for retroactive exemption. All right, excise taxes. The IRS doesn't have, or California doesn't have the excise taxes that the IRS has. Now, excise taxes, for lack of a better term, is basically a fine for, for hoarding. You're collecting $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 from your donors and you're not doing anything with it, the IRS is going to start hitting you with taxes. California is going to hit you with a love letter. Hey, congratulations, you're under audit. Because we want to know what you're doing if you're not spending your money for your charitable purpose. All right? Okay, let's skip over. Okay. So you go three years without filing a return, you get these lovely notices, and then you get a notice that says your organization is suspended, you cannot conduct or transact business in the state of California, you've lost your income tax exemption, you know, you owe this much money, and things start to get scary, right? And you know, I'm not gonna make anybody raise their hands, but guaranteed somebody in this room has been through that process. Call us. We are used to dealing.